We've been going through a series on Ephesians, and we're into chapter 4 in Ephesians, and we've gotten all the way up to verse 15. So why don't we stand together, and, and let's read Ephesians 15, and also I'd like to read the next verse, 16. Ephesians, the fourth chapter... And starting with verse 15 and 16, it says these words, But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him, who is the head, even Christ, verse 16, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. It says here in the fourth chapter of Ephesians, it's really talking here about the great times of the church age. It's not talking so much when the church falters, although we'll get to that. And it's not talking so much about the interim time between when the church is experiencing a number of different things, but it's talking about four things. It's talking about, and this is the introduction, It's talking about being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies. Now, there were a few times in church history where this was actually happening. The second one, proper working of each individual part. So we're looking at four things when the church peaks, being fitted together by that which every joint supplies. So there's times when the joints are all supplying, when we're really operating together. There's times when the proper working of each individual part is happening. Third, the growth of the body, where the motivation of the church during this time is for the growth of the body, primarily spiritually, although certainly numbers are important, but primarily spiritually. And fourth, the building up of itself in love. Now, as we go through this history we're going to be talking about, I'm going to pause, and it's not really a pause because we really are injecting this as part of this wonderful scripture in Ephesians. We're going to be looking at the history of the church as laid out in Revelation 2 and 3. Now there's without a doubt in Revelation 2 and 3, and by the way, you probably want to turn there now to Revelation 2. But without a doubt, when the Apostle John was talking about the churches, he was certainly talking about the seven churches that were currently functioning at that point in history. But I believe the entire book of Revelation is prophetic. The whole Revelation talks about what is coming. So there's a duality in chapters 2 and 3, one, the current church at that point in history, and two, there's a sense of prophecy of where the church was going. It says in Joel 2, and the same phrase is in Malachi 4, it talks about the great and terrible day of the Lord. So chapters 2 and 3 are the church growth that was coming through the centuries until you start hitting into chapter 4 and onward through the end of Revelation where the church has been translated and the events of the terrible day of the Lord unfold. Are we together so far? Okay. So these seven stages of the church, and this is an important piece, were all spoken by Jesus Christ. 
So if you have a red letter edition in your Bible, it should have what he is saying to these seven churches in red. Because these are all spoken by Christ. The first stage of the church was the Ephesus church. Now, I can't say enough about the Ephesus church. The church at Ephesus was really the pattern. It really exploded with the apostles and the doctrine that was correct. It was a wonderful, wonderful church. Not perfect, but it certainly was wonderful. Now, Revelation 2, verse 3, talks about the Ephesus church. And this is what Jesus Christ is saying. He says, you have steadfastness and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. Oh, to the Ephesus church ever go through trauma as the world was hating it and the church was being born and it was beginning to function. Now, we did an entire series on the apostles, on we called it the 12. It says in Acts 17 verse 6, it talks about these men who have turned the world upside down. These 12 guys <laughs> turned the world upside down. That was the whole deal. They laid the foundation for the crumbling of the Roman Empire. They certainly laid the foundation for the church, which we still have 21 centuries later. I mean, these guys did a deal. Now, I know Christ got them going. We, I'm aware of that. But these are the guys that took it out worldwide. So I want to honor and talk about these 12. Now, throughout this series, we're going to be talking about the greats of the church, the greats. But if you've got to talk about the greats of the church, you've got to talk starting with the apostles. You've got to start with the disciples of Christ. That's the place to start. It is amazing at least to me, what these guys did. I mean, you talk about travel. I mean, when they traveled, it was by foot <laughs> or by, you know, donkey, or maybe they would, could afford occasionally because they were being financed a camel, <laughs> and you still weren't moving very fast. And I've been, my wife and I, we've been to a number of the places they went to, and it takes us six, seven, eight hours by flight, in some cases 12 or 15 hours by flight to get there. And so when we just rattle off these places, these disciples went, the apostles went, do not take it for granted. I mean, this was a deal. Let's start with Thaddeus. So you got your number one is Thaddeus, also called Jude. And Thaddeus went to Syria He went to Persia, and I don't know if you're aware of this, you probably are, but Jude established the first Christian nation in the world. Are you, are you aware of this? He established the first Christian nation, Edessa, E-D-E-S-S-A, -S Edessia, and Edessia was the first Christian nation in the world, but it cost him. Big time, because he was hated. Has anybody ever disliked you because of your witness for Christ? I did a message, which I posted about two weeks ago, called the Lake of Fire. To say it was not popular is an understatement. In this culture, it completely goes against what the culture believes and what the church is teaching. Mm-hmm. But the response is overwhelmingly hateful and negative. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear this. Everybody likes to hear about sweet Jesus. Everybody likes to hear about heaven and the beauty and how we're all going to be there. But that isn't what the Bible says. I don't know if you're aware of that. It's not what Scripture is talking about. And we laid this out pretty clearly in this message. 
Same with the apostles, and I don't put myself in that category. I'm just saying they were hated. Jude crucified. So Jude was martyred, crucified for what he had done by bringing the gospel to Persia and Syria and Edessia. Let's go to Matthew. Matthew took the gospel to Ethiopia. You go, no big deal, just run down to Ethiopia. Imagine how long that took him to get to Ethiopia from Jerusalem. He also took the gospel, not just Ethiopia, but throughout Arabia. I mean, th this guy really went out there, and it cost him. You're going to hear me say that phrase several times, and it cost him. He was martyred by sword. They stabbed him through. Let's look at Simon the Zealot. You'd say, well, he wasn't very consequential. You hardly even know anything about Simon the Zealot. Oh, really? Egypt didn't feel that way because he took the gospel into Egypt. And if you think that's a long trip, you know where else he went? He went to the Isles of Britannia. You go, no big deal. Just fly into England, <laughs> right? Not so. To have taken the gospel into the Isles of Britannia was a huge deal that Simon did, and it cost him. You see, I'm getting tired of that phrase. Well, there's a reason why the foundation layers or stones of the New Jerusalem are named after these guys, one after another. There's a reason for it. One after another took the gospel to the world and in many cases gave their life. For Simon the Zealot, to take the gospel to the Isles of Britannia, they sawed him in half. And I'm, there's no children here listening to this, but some of this stuff gets really rough. Martyred for the gospel. James. We hear so much about James and John, right? The sons of thunder. But James, while he was taking the gospel in Jerusalem, was grabbed by Herod and was beheaded by Herod. He was the first martyr of the apostles. Now, I understand that Stephen was martyred before him, but the first of the apostles to be martyred was James, John's brother. First apostolic martyr for the gospel was James. Number five, Andrew. Now, I've been to this place, my wife and I have been, where Andrew went. He went to the southern Black Sea. You don't just run down there. I'm just telling you. We've been to the southern Black Sea, and it is a long, long trip to get down below the Ukraine, down into the southern Black Sea. He also took the gospel, Andrew did, to Russia. You thought, well, I thought Russia was a modern missionary field, but here we understand from history that Andrew took the gospel to the southern Black Sea area and to Russia. Did it cost him? It cost him. He was crucified, what they called an ex-crucifixion. This is when you're spread out like this and you're nailed all the way through or roped off and was left there in the sun to die, and it took him two days that's a long time, 48 hours to die of that ex-crucifixion. So what did he do while he was stretched out there for two days? I'm talking about Andrew. He preached. Could you have done this? If you're in the middle of being crucified, could you do this? Could you do this? No, you could not do it. I don't think you could do it. If you're in the middle of agony and being crucified, would you be preaching? The people that were around him were hearing the gospel for 48 hours while he was dying. I mean, these guys are amazing. Amazing. What a heritage. And we're just getting warmed up with this series. What a magnificent, stunning heritage you and I have in these powerful men from the Ephesus stage of the church. Philip, the 6-1 Philip, took the gospel to Asia Minor and North Africa. Again, I've been all across my wife, and I've been 
all across Ghana and Egypt and all across North Africa to the borders of Togo. But we weren't the first to go there. <laughs> the first to go there was our brother, Philip. And it cost him. And it cost him. They hung him on a pillar, hung him on a pillar to die. And he did, particularly after they scourged him so brutally while he was hanging. So he's hanging on the pillar, and they scourged him to death. Nathaniel, also called Bartholomew, number seven. Nathaniel took the gospel into India. India, and also Armenia. Now, he's taken the gospel into what is proven to be one of the darkest places in the world, right? Right? With the whole weird religions that go on in India. <laughs> My dad was there, and one day watched a car swerve to miss a cow, but to swerve to miss the cow, he had to kill a little girl. So he had to choose the driver between a little girl and a cow, and he chose the little girl. Killed her so he would not hit the cow. But this kind of darkness exploded on top of Nathaniel as he brought the gospel. But I will tell you how Nathaniel died. They skinned him to death. It's called flayed, where they take your skin and pull it up, and you can imagine the agony of his death. I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing this man and thanking him. Thank you, Nathaniel, for your faithfulness to the gospel. James, the son of Alphaeus, took the gospel to Spain, Syria. Isn't this amazing? I mean, these guys have been all around the world taking the gospel into Spain and Syria. He died by being, they first stoned him and didn't kill him, so then they finished him off by clubbing him to death. Again, martyred for the gospel. Thomas. We hear about the doubting Thomas. I always hate that phrase because this was a powerful, powerful man of God. And those that criticize Thomas, I don't believe will ever walk in the level of faith and power that Thomas walked in. But he took the gospel to the Parthian Empire and also he helped with the massive nation of India. So Thomas was on his knees praying when four soldiers surrounded him and speared him to death while he was in the middle of prayer. Thomas. Peter, you know so much about Peter. Number 10, Peter. Obviously in Jerusalem, also in Corinth, also in Rome. Now when they went to crucify Peter, and they did, when they went to crucify him, Peter said, no deal, I will not be experiencing death in the same way as my Savior. I'm not worthy of it. Can you imagine this kind of phrase? I'm not worthy of being crucified the same way as my Savior. Crucify me upside down. So they turned him upside down, as if it wasn't enough to be crucified, turned him upside down and crucified him upside down. It was at the request of the monster, the monster Nero. And Nero was such a brute. Number 11, Judas had betrayed the Lord Jesus. Now, I probably will be criticized for this. So this is me, okay, this is Paul, your pastor. This isn't Bible, but this is just my feeling, okay? You ready? <laughs> this is my feeling. The 11th one is Matthias. And Judas had betrayed the Lord, and the disciples felt like they needed to real quickly replace Judas. And so they drew lots between two guys, and Matthias' name was drawn, and so they made him Judas' replacement. This is just my personal opinion. I think they should have waited a little while because the Lord had Paul in mind. But nevertheless, <laughs> maybe not, but it, it seems like the Apostle Paul certainly was meant to take that place. But Matthias, praise God for our brother. He took the gospel to Cappadocia. He also went into Syria. Now, he's the only one of the 
12, well, 13 if you include Paul, but, and I do. He was the only one burned at the stake. Again, martyr, 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 martyr. All of these wonderful men of God. Let's talk about briefly the Apostle Paul. I've already mentioned him. You talk about a missionary, a guy that carried the gospel to the farthest reaches. The Apostle Paul went on four missionary journeys. Three of them were quite long. The last one just took him to Rome where he's ultimately executed, martyred by the same monster that killed Peter, probably the same day. We don't know that for sure, but very, very close in time that the Apostle Paul was beheaded the same time that Peter was crucified upside down. But we've been to the Appian Way, and I couldn't help but think, when you go to the Appian Way in Rome, and you see in all the glory of Rome and the rubble of that glory, I couldn't help but think this is where our brother Paul and our brother Peter gave his life for the gospel. The last one is obviously the Apostle John. The Apostle John obviously had his ministry in Jerusalem, but the spectacular ministry he had while he was imprisoned in Patmos. Oh, I mean, he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John before he went to, to, to prison. He wrote the Gospel of John, but in Patmos, he wrote the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Probably the most powerful, I would say it is, the most succinct end times, last times book of the entire Bible. Laying out things that we're still studying this morning and we'll probably still be studying next week as well. Now, he ended, I'm talking about John, he ended his ministry in Ephesus, finished writing the Revelation in 93 A.D., and finally died in 100 A.D. I'm sure the church always thought that he was going to be around until Christ returned. And matter of fact, that he wouldn't ended up being in the Scripture, but Jesus didn't say he would be around. He said, I, if I will, he can stay, and I would have him stay until I return. But he didn't say he would be there, but he certainly stayed alive and vibrant right to the end. Paul, he had wonderful disciples, and we'll talk about them in a moment, but the Ephesus church really made way for the Smyrna church. So we have the Ephesus church, and the second stage of the church is the Smyrna church. Okay, let's look at Revelation, chapter 2, verse 10. Again, these are the words of our Lord, Revelation 2, 10. It says, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, that you may be tested, this is Revelation 2, 10, and you shall have tribulation 10 days, or that's a long period of time in Scripture. 10 days doesn't mean 10, 24-hour days. This is a sign of a long period of time. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And you've heard ministry on the crowns. Here's one of the crowns of life. The Smyrna church was the church of the Antinacian fathers. And let me spell this because you know people always get this wrong. Anta is not anti, it's anta, A-N-T-E. It means before. Nicene, N-I-C-E-N-E, the Antinacian fathers. That's what we're going to study now. And again, I think this is important. We have this background that we understand what kind of soil or really rock we stand on 
in these wonderful men of God. Now, the Antinician fathers went from when John passed all the way until the Council of Nicene, or Nicaea, which was actually happened in Istanbul. My wife and I, again, were in Istanbul, and there were so many things to see, but we wanted to see where the Nicaean Creed was written. And so we went to the place, the church nobody was interested in, and it was all overgrown outside. But there it was, and we were so happy to, to get to it and to see it. By the way, so much of this stuff we've had personal experience with, but Nicaea was the end of the anti-Nicaean father's stage of the church, or the Smyrna church. There are nine anti-Nicaean, anti-Nicaean fathers. Now, this is a deal to try to study this, because the world, or the liberal church, is always sticking in these other guys in there, and you really have to sort through of what is really a father, a really a church father, and who was really a heretic. I mean, the difference between Clement the First and Clement the Second was gigantic, and I'll explain it in just a moment. We're fans of which one? Clement the First, okay? Not Clement the Second. But we'll go through this. Here come the Antinician fathers. Number one, Justin Martyr. And you're right, that is his last name. Martyr. Justin Martyr wanted so much to give his life for Christ. Talked about it all the time that he was looking forward to dying for Christ. And when he finally, and he sure was executed, he sure was martyred. But the word martyr comes from his name. And it was the whole sense of being willing, not loving your life unto death, right? And this is what's talked about in the being a martyr, but it goes back to Justin Martyr, that phrase. So we give him honor, certainly, as the one of the Antonician fathers. Second, Tertullian. You go, what did Tertullian do? Well, it was important what Tertullian did. Tertullian actually was the first time to ever put any kind of Christian literature into Latin. Now, I understand above Christ... You know, here's King of the Jews was written in Latin and in Greek and in Hebrew. But he was the first one really to roll out Christian literature in Latin. And that was very important because at this point, Rome ruled the world. And so the language of Latin to get it out was very important. Tertullian. Third, Oregon. Oregon brought in the whole theology of free will. You can decide to accept Christ. Now, understand predestination. We'll talk about that in a moment. That he knows and has willed who will reject him and who will accept him. But still, God has created us in such a way that we can really decide. He certainly knows what we're going to decide, but that doesn't change our choice of free will. And we just take that for granted. But Oregon is the guy that brought this out. He really wrote about it and spoke about it. So we honor Oregon. Fourth one is Iranius. Iranius battled heresy, but he battled it in France. And I think that's important because as we get deeper in to eschatology, and we will a little bit later, France is the center of Europe and the center of the European Union and the center, I believe, of what is going to unfold in coming days. So watch France, but Certainly, Iranius, spelled I-R-E-N-A-E-U-S. I'll spell it again. You ready? <laughs> okay. I-R-E-N-A-E-U-S. South France, battled heresy. The sixth one is Athanasius. Again, I'll spell it for us, okay? <laughs> A-T-H-A-N-A-S-I-U-S, Athanasius. You go, what's the big deal about Athanasius? Well, Athanasius really was the first one to bring in the theology and really our understanding of the Trinity. And that's a big deal, that Christ was God, the Spirit is God, the Father is God. The whole issue of Trinitarianism was brought in initially 
by Athenaceus. So hopefully you're learning a few pieces, but I'm, I'm really hoping this, you know, teaches us. Cyprian is the next one, number six, Cyprian. I think if I had to put a label on the greatest pastor during the Antonician church father stage, I would give it to Cyprian. He was pastor in Carthage, and he's really a model of the love of God for his people. So this wonderful man, Cyprian, spelled C-Y-P-R-I-A-N, Cyprian, Pastor Cyprian. Now the last three, the last three, and I saved the last three for the last, these last three are probably the most important of all the church fathers. And there's a reason for that. These last three were discipled directly by the 12. And they are. First one is Polycarp. Polycarp was John's disciple. And Polycarp was noted for having much fruit. Wouldn't that be nice to have that said about you? (laughs) Oh, I remember her. She was full of the fruit of the Spirit and full of God. Well, Polycarp certainly had much fruit. He was John's disciple. John, of course, the apostle of love. And so beautiful and so sweet his spirit. Isn't it interesting that God used the apostle of love to write the revelation, and then he passed it on to his disciple, Polycarp. The second one is Ignatius. Now, this is number seven and eight in your list you're making. But Ignatius of Antioch, he was also John's disciples. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but historically, he was considered Ignatius. People always thought of him. And this, to me, was interesting as one of the children that Jesus brought to himself. So Christ had suffered. You remember that? Suffer the little children to come unto me. And they've always, it went through history that one of those little children was, in fact, Ignatius. What a heritage, (laughs) what a history to be held by the Lord. And one of the children that was, that Christ said, suffer the little children to come to me. The last, the ninth one of the church fathers of the Antinocian stage of the church was Clement of Rome. Get it right, okay? Clement of Rome, or Clement I, very different than Clement of Alexandria. Clement of Rome was a disciple of Peter, the apostle Peter, and held the gospel tight, unlike the other Clement of Alexandria, or Clement II, that really mixed all his writings with Plato and the Stoics. We don't go there, right? (laughs) We don't go with Plato and the Stoics as being part of our gospel. So Clement I from the church of Smyrna. I'm going to stop there. There's so much more, and it's coming. There's a huge amount. Let me ask you to take some time this week to look over your notes And to thank God for these wonderful men, these powerful guys that gave their lives. And let me just throw this one out in closing. Virtually all of the anti-Nicene fathers were martyrs. Not all of them, but virtually all of the nine that I've laid out here. And virtually all of the apostles, right? 11 out of 12, and if you count Paul... 12 out of 13, were martyrs for Christ. What a heritage, what a glory we have. Lord bless you.